Wow, you guys got really quiet real fast. <laughs> Fellowship time over with. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. We're going to begin by singing that our God reigns forever this morning, so let's begin our worship this morning by singing together. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We are again excited about what God is doing here at Clough Pike. Excited to begin another worship service uh, with the celebration of baptism. Uh, excited to announce the transformation from old life to new life because we know that if anybody is in Christ, they are a new creation. The first person I'm going to invite down is, is Rick. And so, Rick, come down here. You can say hello to a few friends. And um, so a couple weeks ago, uh, Rick and, and Ricky were talking. And um, what Rick shared with Ricky, that's our youth pastor, not to get anybody confused, um, was that about 15 years ago, uh, he kind of went through the motions of accepting Christ, uh, primarily so he could marry his beautiful wife, right? Yes. There we go. But just really felt that it was never sincere. It was never real in his heart. And so uh, a week or two ago, Rick made a profession of faith, said, I want Jesus not just to be something that, you know, I did in the past or whatever so that I could marry Amanda, but I want Jesus for my own. And so Rick accepted Jesus Christ as his per personal Lord and Savior. Is that about right? Yes. We'll do. You know, the, the reality is, is that, um, you know, it's not saying a prayer. It's not going through emotion. 
but it is truly trusting Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, as your God. Rick, do you believe that you've done that? Yes. All right. Well, Rick, I'm going to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to new life in Jesus Christ. Now, Amanda came as well. And uh, Amanda's story is, is a little bit different from Rick's. Uh, Amanda said the, kind of said the sinner's prayer at uh, eight years old, but uh, felt that she had done it because, you know, I guess everybody else was doing it at the time, or uh, it was that time to, to say the, the prayer. You know, and it, it's a reminder, Amanda's uh, testimony is a reminder that it's, you know, you can grow up in church and that doesn't make you a Christian. Um, you can come to church every time the doors are open and that doesn't make you a Christian. You know, uh, my youth pastor used to say that uh, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. And, um, you know, so Amanda came and she said, you know, I, I, I said this prayer at eight years old, but I didn't feel like my life ever changed. I didn't feel like I ever gave my life fully to Jesus. And, and maybe you're like that today. And, and talking to Amanda, even on Wednesday night, she said she wants you to know that um, even if you grew up in church, even if you've been here all your life, if you haven't put your hope, your trust, your life in Jesus, that you need to do that today, just as she did that a couple weeks ago. Is that right? Amanda, I'm going to ask you to come over here. Amanda, have you truly put your hope and trust in Jesus? And if you died today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Yes. And right, I'm going to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to new life in Jesus Christ. It is always a celebration to see new life, uh, truly new life, not dead, stale religion going through the motions. Listen, if you have been going through the motions, let me encourage you this morning, just like Rick, just like Amanda, you can have new life in Jesus Christ. If there is anything we want you to know here at Clough this morning is you can have life in Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and we are so thankful uh, for the life change that you've given to, to Rick and to Amanda. God, that you have blessed them uh, with the best gift ever of salvation, God, that it's not turning over a new leaf. It's not becoming a better person, but it is completely being transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ day by day as we live our life and trust you completely. We know that uh, if salvation is on our own terms, it's no salvation at all. We can't get to you. But while we were yet sinners, your word says that you came and died for us. So we put our faith, our hope, our trust in you this morning. We lift our hands, our voices, and worship uh, you this morning. We praise you, Jesus, for what you are doing in this place. God, thank you for the beauty of your creation, the beauty of your snow. Uh, and Lord, the reminder that you have washed us white as snow if we've put our faith in you, God. We thank you so much for what you are doing here at Clough. We love you. We praise you and give you thanks. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand and continue to worship this morning? So we're going to sing that again. We're going to sing, I know my, my Redeemer lives. So raise your hand if you know that Jesus is alive. Now, if you believe Jesus is alive, can you say amen? Amen. All right, thank you. It's okay to be excited about the fact that our God lives, right? That's, that's reason for us to be here together. So let's, uh, let's sing this again. I know that my Redeemer lives. Here we go. I know. I know.
morning, I don't know where you are this week. I don't know what kind of week you've had. But what I would ask of us this morning as we sing that in Christ alone our hope is found, that we would understand what that truly means. What we build our lives on, the foundation that we place, is of utmost importance. This morning, Psalm, 1, Psalm 18 says this, says, I love you, O Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved. This morning, is the Lord the one that you call on? As Rick and Amanda have shown through their testimony of baptism this morning, where do you stand with our God this morning? Is your hope built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? Is your, is your life built on money? Is your life built on your family? Because it's not enough. So just in the stillness of this moment, the quiet of this room, I would ask that you would just talk to your God and ask that he would remind you that he is your foundation. He is the strength, the rock that we stand on.
Lord, this morning we sing, knowing you is the goal of our life. Lord, we seek you in this year. Lord, mostly, Lord, this morning we come before you in the present, in the now. And Lord, say, God of the universe, the one who stretched his hands out to create this beautiful world. Lord, we want to know you this morning. So, Lord, may the word of God that you you have given to us, may the word of God that is shared through Josh this morning, Lord, may it draw us closer to you, and Lord, may we know you more at the end of this day. And Lord, as we walk away from this place in a little bit, God, may the song that is in our heart be that we know our God this morning. And Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't, Lord, I pray that you would stir in their hearts a need for you. So Lord, we seek to know you this morning. And I thank you that you are God, that if we seek after you, you will be found. So Lord, be with us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a seat, everybody. Today I want to discuss the great contemporary theologian Taylor Swift. Uh, Doug did not hit a wrong button. Um, Unless you've been in a cave, uh, you would probably find it difficult to live life without hearing uh, Taylor Swift's new song, Out of the Woods. Uh, so Taylor Swift's song, Out of the Woods, it debuted, um, at least the music video debuted on uh, New Year's Eve and has seen more than 15, some 20 million uh, views on YouTube. And, you know, uh, basically, just so you know, Natasha, I realized that this song is about her breaking up with whoever from One Direction. And I realize that gives you hope, but um, we're going to keep focused here. All right. So, so basically, this song, Out of the Woods, is, is about Taylor's troubled uh, relationship with uh, one of the members of One Direction, and it's this, you know, beautifully brilliant, crafted pop uh, song that gets stuck in your head. I've had it in my head, unfortunately, all morning. Thank you for doing such a good job leading worship. That helped for a little while, anyway. So, you know, but uh, just this wonderful, you know, uh, song that uh, has Taylor Swift, and she's on this journey. She's being chased by wolves, and, and yes, Natasha, I realize none direction, One Direction uses wolves in their music videos, and so I, I get it. She's being chased by wolves, and uh, she's singing out of the woods, out of the woods, out of the woods, and something else. And uh, along the way, she, you know, goes through the, the woods. She goes uh, into the ocean. She goes into some snowy, picturesque uh, you know, f- uh, areas like this, and show a couple of, of the clips here, Doug. So the next one, she's kind of traveling a little bit long. She's getting stuck. She's breaking through. Uh, she comes out, and she's really, really dirty, and she comes out onto a beach. And on the beach, she sees this lady that's standing right next to the ocean, and she's all dirty, and the lady on the ocean, she's all pristine, and she goes up, and she puts her hand right on top of the lady's shoulder, and the lady turns around, and there it is. It's Taylor Swift. See, Out of the Woods is about a relationship on the rocks. It's about trying to work through issues uh, until restoration takes place. But the end of the music video has this little bit of a twist. See, when Taylor emerges from her struggles, all scuffed up and muddy, she walks forward into a pristine, unharmed Taylor lookalike on the beach, and as soon as she puts her hand on the identical woman's shoulder, the song's over, and these words appear on the screen. There are the next three slides here. She lost him, but she found herself. And somehow, that was everything. Sounds really emotional, just, you know, tearjerker works you up, Right? She lost him, but she found herself, and somehow that was everything, and, and somehow that resonates deep inside of our culture. It resonates deep inside of us, like, isn't that where we're looking for? We're looking to find ourselves. Doesn't, isn't that what, you know, life is all about? See, in a matter of minutes and in just a few words, Taylor Swift's music video provides a popular level version of what philosophers and sociologists called expressive, evan- or expressive individualism. It's the idea that the purpose of life is to find and to express yourself individually. You find yourself by fighting through 
all the constraints placed upon you by others. The goal is to emerge triumphant, fully aware of your own unique essence so that you can express yourself to the world. Now here's the problem. And it's not with Taylor Swift and it's not with the song in general. In no way do I really think that we ought to derive our theology from Taylor Swift. I hope that you know, encourages you this morning. But here's the problem. It's with the state of humanistic rational, of the humanistic rationale of our day and time. The problem with the song is that it's antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to explain that as we go. If we go ahead and we're going to stand this morning, we're going to remind ourselves of the gospel We're going to remind ourselves of our call to revival and to seeking him. And so this is what we said our definition of revival is going to be. Revival is an infusion of divine life into the body of Christ, which enables the church to love unconditionally, rejoice exceedingly, serve productively, live victoriously, praise appropriately, minister freely, and witness effectively. And I would add to that maybe this morning and find ourselves not in who we are, but in who Christ is. Before you click to the next slide, Doug, here's the pop quiz, right? Were you ready for this? We had a memory verse that we were going to work on. I'm going to stand over here because I forgot my mic in the back. We had a memory verse that we were going to work on. It comes from Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. So before Doug puts it up, we're going to try to say it together. Hosea 10, 12. Break up your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness upon you. All right, so that was the test. How'd you guys do? Okay, we'll keep working on it. It's good. Here is our memory verse for next week in the verse which we are going to dig into this morning. It comes from Luke 14, verse 11. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let me do this one more time, because I didn't actually ask you to read it along with me. So this time, read it with me. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we come to you this morning, and um, Lord, oftentimes the world tells us that um, we can find ourselves as we battle through uh, whatever it is that life throws our way or the oppression that other people lay upon us, or we can find ourselves within groups and cliques and um, whatever else there is out there, maybe through drugs, maybe through alcohol, maybe through sex, maybe... Uh, through marriage, maybe through children. We can find ourselves in all of these things, but God, whether they're good things or whether they're bad things, um, whether they're godly things or whether they're ungodly things, the ultimate reality is that we can only find ourselves when we lay ourselves at your feet. We can only find ourselves when we surrender to your gospel. We can only find ourselves, our true selves, as you created us to be, in Jesus Christ. So it's my prayer this morning that, Lord, we don't look to Taylor Swift or to outside culture to tell us how to find ourselves. But as we seek you this morning, we would look to you and we would see who you created us to be. Worshippers, bringing you glory, knowing you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning. The reason that it's antithetical, Taylor Swift's song is antithetical to the gospel, is that it provides this pop pop cultural narrative that we're supposed to find ourselves so that we can express ourselves and reveal ourselves to the world, and that in finding ourselves in our own individual lives, that that somehow that is the ultimate meaning and purpose of life. And we can test that with what the gospel says, is that it's actually in losing ourselves that we find ourselves. It's actually in finding the man, Jesus Christ, that makes it all worth it. 
And so when we look at a couple of different things this morning and talk about this idea of being humble, which is going to be uh, the journey that you guys are going to take in your Seeking Him workbooks over this next week, we're going to see that humility means that we are submitting ourselves to salvation God's way. It is uh, submitting ourselves to doing life God's way. And it is submitting ourselves to doing church God's way. And that has nothing to do with us. How many times did we mention I in that context? Zero. Goose egg, right? It's about God's way, not our way. Humility comes from doing it his way. So let's go ahead and have a further look at the context of our memory verse here in Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, the parable starts in verse 7, and it's a parable that Jesus is telling about a wedding feast, and this is what he says. He says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited, and when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, "When When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give up your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you arrive, and are, or when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. When we look at what Jesus is talking about in the context of Luke chapter 14, he gives this parable and he follows it up by a couple of other parables. The second parable that he gives in this chapter is the parable of the great banquet, relating this to the kingdom of God. And finally, he ends with another parable where, or, or story where he says that this, there's cost to following him. And he talks about this cost. And, and we're going to look a lot at what Jesus says in the word of God because the reality is, is that it is antithetical to what the world says we ought to be doing. And so I've titled this message this morning, Life in Reverse. Jesus says some odd things to our contemporary culture um, in his word. The Bible says things like, the last will be first and the first will be last, found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it a man that he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with the angels in glory and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What an odd couple of passages found in Matthew. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. How odd is it that you know when we lay down our life, we find it, and if we try to save our life, then we lose it. See, the world tells us that it should be all about us. That's this idea that Taylor Swift is promoting, that you know you go through these trials in life, but you come out a more pristine and a better person, and you know that's what living is all about. Well, we do go through cr- trials, and sometimes God does put trials in our way, but it's not so that we could somehow be a better version of ourselves. It's so that we could somehow be more like Jesus Christ. It's not about finding ourselves, but it's about falling more in love with Jesus. Finally, Matthew says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We look at these verses and it's very clear that salvation is not about, you know, finding ourselves or coming to God on our own terms, but salvation is about coming to God on his terms. In other words, salvation is absolutely 100% God's way. You have no other alternative, and that's this is the gospel message. The good news is that you are free to come to Jesus. The bad news is that 
We can't do it on our own. And so many, uh, so many times we struggle in life trying to simply do it on our own. And talking to Amanda and to Rick, you know, they you know, shared their story with me, and there's not really a, a clear example of this. And so it's just important to reiterate to you this morning, because oftentimes you know, we think, well, I'm a good person. Oftentimes we think that, well, I come to church. And so God will see me coming to church and he will say, you know, well, that's good enough. Read again Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So we look at this and we say, is coming to church enough? Well, I serve in the nursery or I serve in the children's ministry. Is serving in the children's ministry enough? What is it that makes us right with God? Salvation God's way means that we say, God, you are God, I'm not. It's no longer what I want, it's what you want. And so I'm surrendering my life, I'm laying it down. This is the idea of humility, right? Putting it down so that you become my Lord and my Savior. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace we are saved through faith, and it's not of works, not of ourselves. So no one can boast. How many of us and how many that are around us on a weekly basis are trying to get to God on their own terms? God says, you can't get to me on your terms. You must come to me on my terms. This morning, let me just share this with you because I shared it with you from the baptistry and I want to reiterate it just one more time. Maybe this morning you have been coming to church Maybe you've been coming to Clough for a while. Um, what we want you to hear this morning loud and clear and in love is that it's not coming to church that is going to make you right with God. It's going to be going to God and asking, repenting of your sins and asking him to come into your life as your Lord and as your Savior. That's what makes you right with God. The thing that I like to often say is that Christ died so that we might live, and therefore we live, right, in return for him. And so, listen to me this morning. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a personal relationship with him, let me just beg you for a moment. As your friend, let me beg you for a moment. This morning there is a way to get right with God. And we just ask that at the end of the service today, you would talk to one of us. We would love nothing more than to share that with you. But humility goes further than just, you know, salvation. It's not just salvation God's way, but it is life God's way as well. The, world sa or the word says in John 17, which is Jesus' high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying for his disciples. So before you and I were even a thought in our mom and dad's eyes, Jesus was praying for you and me that as we are followers of Christ. And, and he's praying for us and he says, Father, I'm praying for them that you would let them stay in the world, but that they wouldn't be of the world. And one of my concerns as I, we think about humility this morning is that a lot of churches have become very worldly. The idea that Jesus was giving in John 17 is literally as believers in Christ, we are to be otherworldly in our attitudes and in our actions. I don't think that what he meant is for us to be weird. Have you met weird people before? I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at. I do think what he meant is that we are to be godly and holy as is our father in heaven is holy this is why we as the body of christ cannot acquiesce to the standards of the world our standards on life and the value and value and morals come from he who created the world not from the world itself and so we need to be taking our directions from the god who created the world we need to be taking our directions from his word and not taking our directions from well Taylor Swift, or taking our directions from our friends, or taking our directions even from family. It's so easy to hear, you know, really, you know, I guess pithy comments and say, well, that sounds good. You know, that sounds good. Maybe this is how I need to be living my life, but if it doesn't line up with God's word, is that how we need to be living our life? Humility means that we consider the word of God greater than the word of the world. 
So we cannot acquiesce with the world's standards of when life begins. We cannot acquiesce in saying that abortion is okay. We cannot acquiesce in saying that euthanasia in any form is okay. The word of God tells us that life, that life begins with God, and through him we live and breathe. We cannot acquiesce to the world's standards of sexual morality. And so if you're a single adult, let me li just listen to me for a minute uh, this morning. Marriage is becoming one flesh, spiritual, physical, emotional, and financial. Does that catch? Marriage becoming one flesh, the way the Bible describes it, is supposed to be spiritual, physical, emotional, and financial. How about this? If a person is willing to sleep with you without being married to you, in essence, what they are telling you is that they desire to be one with you physically, but they do not desire to be one with you emotionally. They do not desire to be one with you spiritually. They do not desire to be one with you financially. So ladies, the way I just described it here, how many of you are ready to sign up for that? No? Men in the room today. What kind of man are you if you are okay with that? See, God has called us to a way that is much more satisfying. But oftentimes we have bought hook, line, and sinker into the lies that the world says um, and that, that the world tells us. That basically the world says that God is trying to keep something good from us and the reality is, is that God is trying to save something great for us. I guess this is what I'm trying to say, and my iPad wasn't working again this morning, so I apologize, my notes. But this is, I, I guess, what I want to say to you this morning. Whether it comes to where, when life begins, or whether it comes to sexual morality, or whether it comes uh, to other things that, that God calls sin, you know, we will choose to either align ourselves with God, or we're going to choose to align ourselves with the world. We're either going to choose to say, you know, what God says is right, or we're going to say what I think, what I feel in the moment is right. And oftentimes the trappings of the church in our day and time is that we decide time and time again to go with our feeling. We decide time and time again to go with our emotions rather than to go with the one who doesn't change, who's the same yesterday and today and tomorrow, and, and who's never going to change. We decide to go with the word of the world instead of going with the word of God. We say we believe God's word. We say that we believe that this is, you know, how God has chosen to reveal himself to us, but then we don't live by it. So let me just, you know, share this illustration with you. I've done it before, but let me do it again this morning. How many of you believe that God created you? Really simple question. How many of you believe that the word of God is right when it says he knows the number of hairs that are on your head? How many of you have counted those hairs? All right, hands down. So by your own admission, you believe God created you and that he knows you better than you know yourself. Now, how many of you believe the word of God is true when it says that God wants what's best for you? God wants what's best for me. The Bible says it time and time again. And Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. How many of you want that promise? How many of you want a hope and a future? It's real easy. We raise our hands, right? So God created us. God knows us better than we know ourselves. God desires what's best for us. But then... How much sense does it make that we regularly don't agree with God? We say, God, you, you know, you must be lying about this, right? We don't agree with God because if he created us and he knows us better than we know ourselves and he wants what's best for us, then it makes sense if we're following this line of logic that what God says is best for us is actually what's best for us. But whether it comes to when life begins or whether it comes to sexual morality or whether it comes to gluttony or whether it comes to lying or whether it comes to whatever sin we struggle with, filling in the blank. And it's so easy to, to look at sexual morality, I think, you know, when we look at this. And Mandy and I were talking about it earlier this week. You know, 
just to give you a hypothesis to let you think on it just for a second, right? If one generation, one generation were to abstain from sex until marriage, just one generation, it completely obliterates all STDs. Just no more in the entire world. Is that what's going to happen? Is that reality? No, it, it's not. But we can't look at what God says and say that it's not what's best for us. Because time and time again, he's proven that he desires what's best for us and what he says is best for us. How many of you, if you've been following Christ for a long time, have said, God, I know that you want me to live this way, but I think it's okay if I live this way and you've fallen flat on your face. I've done it. And I come back humbly and I say, God, you had this right. What you said is best for me is actually what is best for me. So let me implore you as a church, the first thing was we got to come to salvation God's way. We got to realize we can't come to God on our own terms. We must come to God on his terms. But then as we live this life as a Christian, we must live on his terms as well. Our life is supposed to be life God's way. And if we will choose to live life God's way, it might not always be easy. Yes, there will still be trials. But it is absolutely, without a shadow of doubt, in my mind, what is best for us. Jesus promise us, promises us in the Gospel of John that I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. You know, it's so easy for us to say, I want that life. I want the abundant life. I want to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. I want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But what comes before that is rejecting the things of the world. If we read that, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, it says that we're supposed to reject the things of the world, the idolatry and sexual immorality and drunkenness and the things that the world says are, are good. And we're supposed to turn to what Christ says is good. So we must come to salvation God's way. We must come and do life God's way rather than buying into the lies that the world has told us. And finally, we must also come to church God's way. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and flip over to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, it talks a little bit more about humility and doing church God's way. Well, in Philippians chapter 2, it says this, and we'll start, um, I'll start in verse 1. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love, being in one accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here is what Paul is saying. Church isn't supposed to be about you. It comes as a shocker, I think, in our culture that says that, you know, church is supposed to always feel good. That every time I come to church, I ought to enjoy the music. That every time I come to church, I ought to enjoy and be encouraged by the sermon. Sometimes, you know, the music might not be your favorite. Sometimes the sermon might not, you know, might step on your toes. Sometimes, you know, things don't line up the way that you think they ought to. But that's not why you come to church. The idea is that your, our view of church is either that it's going to be a fishing boat 
or it's going to be a cruise ship. Now, if you are on a cruise ship, how many of you guys have been on cruises? I like cruises. They're pretty good, right? What's great about a cruise is that it is about what you want all the time, any time. You get up when you want, there's food ready for you. You get hungry a little bit later, there's food ready for you. You can eat seven times a day at, at, on a cruise, and nobody's going to look at you funny because they're all doing it too, right? You want two appetizers, two entrees, and two desserts? They'll bring it to you. It is all about you. But is that the purpose of a church? See, I would say, as your pastor, the church is supposed to be a whole lot more like a fishing boat. Guess what? Nobody takes a ride on a fishing boat for fun. Nobody talks about a food, the food when they come back from a fishing trip, unless it's the food that you're getting ready to cook, right? Nobody talks about how wonderful the food was while you're out on the trip. But there's a different purpose. The purpose of a cruise is that it caters to you. The purpose of a fishing boat is that it catches fish. When we think about what Jesus said the church was supposed to be, he told his disciples very specifically, he says, come follow me, and I'm not going to give you everything you want. I'm going to make you fishers of men. He told his disciples before he ascended into heaven, he gave them the great commission after he rose from the dead, and he says, you're to go. This is your job. As my disciples, as the church, you're to go. You're to make disciples of every nation. You're to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're to teach them all that I command you, and I'm going to be with you through all of that. It's not going to be about you. It's not about what you want. It is about what I want. So here's the difference in attitude. It's not about coming to get. It's about coming to give. Perhaps some of you came to church this morning and you said, you know, God, I'm coming to church this morning because I really need X. I'm really coming to church. I really hope Aaron plays my favorite song. I'm going to be really disappointed if he didn't. I really hope, you know, that this is what I get out of church. I really hope that so-and-so says hi to me. I really hope that so-and-so takes notice of me. I really hope that somebody likes what I'm wearing because I just bought this new shirt. I really hope that it's about me. Or was your attitude in coming to church this morning, what can I give you, Jesus? One of Aaron's favorite stories in the Old Testament, and he's shared it a couple times recently, and I'll, I'll steal it and share it again, comes from when David um, is commanded by the prophet Nathan to go and buy um, a place known as the threshing floor. And he goes and um, as king, he had right to demand and say, you're going to give me this property. You're going to give me what I want. And as one of David's servants, he would have said, you're right, king, here. It didn't even go that far because the person who owned this threshing floor, which was basically this barn area, said, David, you're king. Let me give it to you. And David's response was, no, no, because I will not offer to God that which cost me nothing. So, Clough Pike Baptist, I'm speaking to you. Did you come to church this morning saying, give me? Or did you come to church this morning? Did you come to worship this morning saying, what can I give you, Jesus? See, there's a great difference between going to church and being the church. And humility comes in saying, God, I came to salvation on your terms. I want to live life on your terms, and we want to be a church on your terms as well. I was reading um, Tom Rainer's new book, and I, I gave it to several of our, our deacons uh, in December. And uh, in this book, it talks about the opening illustration, the opening chapter. It's talking about a, a, a young lady, and, and she marries a guy. And uh, she gets, you know, involved in the church, and she finds it really easy to connect in the church, and uh, she makes some wonderful friends. And somewhere along the way, uh, she realizes, you know, the church is kind of, you know, different. You know, people are, are a little bit particular about where they sit. Uh, they're a little bit particular. They say, well, the music has to be so-and-so, and if somebody comes into the church and they don't look like us, then, well... You know, we're just going to look down our noses at them. 
And she noticed that over time, she began to develop some of the, the same attitudes. She you know, started leading and doing the financial uh, serving team because she was an accountant along the way. And, and she woke up one morning realizing how much she begrudged going to church. Now, along this time, her and her husband, after about nine years of marriage, they get divorced. And, and uh, she spends the next four years not going to church. She's repulsed by it. She doesn't want to be a part of it. Finally, she meets a, a young couple, and they invite her back to church, and she gives them a whole list of reasons that she doesn't want to go to church, and they challenge her with this question. They say, see, are you coming to church? Are you looking for the perfect church? Are you coming to church to get something, or are you coming to church to give something? Whether that's our worship, whether that's our tithes and our offerings, whether that's our time and our talents as, or our service, why do you come to church? This morning as Aaron comes and he leads in a time of invitation, let me, I don't have my mic so I'll stay up here for a second longer and then I'll be down on the floor. Let me challenge you with these three things. Why are you here today? Are you here today thinking that everything is supposed to be about you? For some of you, you've been coming to God on your own terms, expecting that that's okay, and that in doing so, he's going to be pleased. The Bible says that if we want to be saved, we must lay down our life. We must say, Jesus, I'm repenting of my sin, and I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. That is what authentic salvation looks like. For some of you, you said, you know, I know the Bible says this about whatever it is, fill in the blank. But, you know, that's not way, the way I want to live my life. And in doing so, what you are actually saying is, God, I don't believe you actually care. God, I don't believe that you actually want what's best for me. Right? He created you. Number of hairs on your head. Says he wants what's best for you. Can you trust me on this? He actually does. He actually does. And for you this morning, you might be a believer in Christ, but you need to surrender and say, God, I'm coming to you. I'm coming before you this morning and saying, I need to be living your way. For others of you, maybe coming to church has become, well, drudgery. Let me ask, why are you coming? Are you coming to get a certain thing, or are you coming to give to a great big God who deserves all of our hearts, who deserves all of our worship, who deserves everything we have and everything we are? Humility. The one who humbles himself and say, God, salvation is your way. The one who humbles himself and says, God, no matter what culture says, life is your way. The one who humbles himself and says, God, no matter what, church is your way. The Bible says the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who tries to make it all about them, they'll be humbled. This morning as we come to our time of invitation, let me invite you to spend time coming before our God and deal with whatever area you might be struggling with. And as you go through this week, might pray that and say, God, instead of having a me attitude, let me have a you attitude. I want what you want for my life. Whether it's salvation, whether it's confessing sin, or whether it's just coming to God and saying, I want church to be about you. I invite you during this time of invitation to come and uh, talk to God and pour out your heart to him.